and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Animal Care System Science-Based Webinar Series. I'm your host, Austin Carell. Today's presenter is Dr. F. Claire Hankinson. Dr. Hankinson earned her veterinary degree from Purdue University, completed her graduate work and residency at the University of Washington, Seattle, and then became a diplomate of the American College of Laboratory Animal Medicine in 2002. Dr. Hankinson is the Director of Campus Animal Resources and the Attending Veterinarian at Michigan State University. She is an active researcher studying refinements in laboratory animal practice with mice and rats, including genotyping methods, rodent surgery support, thermal regulation issues, and humane endpoints. Animal Care Systems is honored to host Dr. Hankinson's webinar today. The title of her seminar is Updates on Rodent Thermal Regulation. Is it getting hot in here? If you have a question for Dr. Hankinson, please use the question pane in the control panel and we will answer as many questions as we can after the seminar. Dr. Hankinson, the audience is yours. Thank you so much, Austin. Thank you for today on this Tuesday afternoon. Hello from East Lansing, Michigan. Um, I'm at Michigan State right now. And part of the reason why this webinar came about was from the partnership that we embarked upon with Animal Care Systems to look at some of their newer equipment. We'll share some of that information and then we can take questions at the end if anyone wants to ask more. So with that, let's get started. All right, so I'd like to just run us through a little bit of the of what we will be covering today uh, to give everyone a bit. Um, first of all, we're gonna be talking about mice and rats. That's a little more heavy on the mouse information but we'll talk a little bit about the projects that we have been doing with both species. I'd like to highlight issues that have led to the current focus on temperatures to which rodents are exposed. I'll give you some on the thermal biology of mice and rats. They are collectively the most common models for examining mechanisms of human physiology, behavior, and disease. Next, I'd like to point out some of our shared lab animal medicine practices that can impact rodent temperatures. And then I'll we'll round out the presentation with showing some options and means to support temperature needs of rodents. The overall goal for my presentation today is to foundation of information and then some guidance on thermoregulation to the animal science community um, so that we can all really show efficiency and efficacy of biomedical models. So as I mentioned, the first section, why, why are we even concerned about thermoregulation in our animal facilities today. I think it's probably best to start off with the definition. So the thermal neutral zone, which you sometimes will see as TNZ uh, for short, is the range of temperatures where rodents do not need to put any energy into either warming themselves or cooling themselves down to just maintain a core temperature. And I've listed the TNZ of both the mouse and the rat here both in Celsius, so for the mouse, it's 29 to 34 degrees Celsius, and then the Fahrenheit equivalent. Uh, the rat has a slightly lower thermal neutral zone, which is shown there again in the Celsius and the Fahrenheit. So despite the increasing recognition that laboratory rodents prefer warmer temperatures, animal families do set room temperatures below these, really to about 20 to 22 degrees, uh, that comes out to about 68 to 71 degrees Fahrenheit, which we will also refer to throughout this talk as the ambient temperature. And that number really comes kind of historically from what's comfortable for all of us to work at. So the, the neutral zone is around 72 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is a picture, I just thought I'd show you what one of our typical animal housing rooms looks like. I use animal care systems, optimized racks, um, we have cages on all of these. This houses about 100 racks, sorry, 100 cages all together on one rack. Um, and each of the rows that you see, of 10 rows, there are 10 cage slots per rack. Uh, the room air through these is pulled directly through the front of the cage and then is exhausted out through the top. So I'll put my arrow on here. So the exhaust uh, for the whole rack is hooked up to the room. So we have a, a passive flow that comes in as the air changes per um, hour in the room, pull through the cage and go up and out. 
What we want to point out is that because the room air may be cooler, what's pulling through the cage is going to cool these cages and then it will um, evacuate out through that centerpiece. And housing below the lowest end of the TNZ, which we'll call the lower critical point, can subject rodents to what's called cold stress or thermal stress. You may have heard one or both of those terms. And it does impact metabolism, physiology, animal behavior, and immune function. And I'll go into more details throughout the talk on how that happens. So why are we so concerned about this? This is not a new topic. Um, the interesting thing is that this has started at least 10 years ago. Um, we're talking about phenotyping of small animal models and why thermoneutrality matters. The commentary on how phenotyping is basically not working because of these housing temperatures um, has been recognized in a lot of different disciplines, but not published quite as much in lab animal journals, which is why I believe it's probably taken a little bit longer for it to become the pressing topic and at the you know, forefront of our own lab animal community discussions. This is an additional paper by Chris Karp that also mentions cold stress undermining mouse modeling. I like the title of this one. It pretty much just throws it out there. Does it matter that our rodents are cold? And there's a really good statement here that basically states these investigators have compiled evidence showing that the rodents we work with are cold stress, hypermetabolic, hypertensive, sleep deprived, obesity resistant, fever resistant, aging resistant, and tumor prone compared with mice housed at thermoneutrality. Some pretty bold statements um, when you think about it. All of these reviews, and another one I'd just like to show you here, which is in Nature, and I'd really recommend if anyone wants to get a great overview um, just in general about thermoneutrality, this would be a good one to look at. But all of them basically are telling us that the reality is the mice that we're raising at conventional animal room temperatures, what again I mentioned will be our um, you know, ambient or standard temperatures, is really not exhibiting the same phenotype metabolic, metabolically or thermally as mice that we would raise at warmer temperatures, those that would be in line with the rodents natural thermoneutrality. So what does that mean for all the models then? And what does that mean for what we understand about thermal biology? So moving into this section, I'll just cover it briefly so there's a little bit of understanding, but again, I'd encourage people to go to some of the reviews that um, we'll go through today if you'd like more information about it. So the TNZ for select lab animals is what I'd like to show you on this graph. Uh, the definition that we've already talked about is across the top of the screen, metabolic rate is on the y-axis and the ambient temperature, the room temperature is on the x-axis. So what I'd like to show if we just begin to go through the schematics of this, is where the mouse sits as far as where its thermoneutral zone is. And we'll compare that to the hamster, to the rat, and to the rabbit. So in this image, animals do not need to expend energy or heat or cool themselves at the plateau lines. These are the thermoneutral zones here. And at the bottom of each of these is the lower critical temperature that I mentioned. So this lower critical temperature reflects the sensitivity of that particular species to cold and the point at which when they get there, they no longer need to work on heat generation. So the metabolic rates are very high and as temperatures increase and become more warm, the metabolism can drop down. So not as much energy needs to go into the metabolism because the animals are comfortable, their core temperature has been met. I do think it's important to note that in the larger animals, the lower critical temperature actually is less. So I want to thank my colleague Chris Gordon for sharing this modified figure from his 2012 review on the topic. So what are the physiologic alterations that may happen when animals are housed at standard temperatures or ambient temperatures? When thermally stressed, mice in particular undergo the process of a non-shivering thermogenesis. This is driven by the sympathetic nervous system. It ultimately converts glucose and triglycerides into heat. And in order for mice and rats to go through this and engage in the activity, it takes a ton of energy. So rodents have to eat a lot more, and they also will have that increased metabolic and heart rate, which we'll talk about. Because cold temperatures increase glucocorticoid production, the adverse outcomes can include decreased reproductive efficiency, 
They can have altered growth. It's been shown that cold stressed animals long over many generations will have shorter tails and smaller ears. They can have lower organ weights and ultimately immune dysfunction, which can impact multiple models uh, for disease, as you can imagine. To put this last point into more quantitative terms, I had always been taught that the heart rate of a mouse is about 500 beats per minute at rest. Um, it's actually been shown that when you warm a mouse up to 30 degrees Celsius, it drops down to about 300 beats per minute. Um, so that's a really big change, um, not only for the animal, for the amount of energy it has to put into staying warm, but also impacts blood pressure as well. Blood pressures, which we maybe thought were much higher, at warm temperatures drop quite considerably. In fact, it's estimated probably about 30% drop. And so what we may see is that animals, when they are ambient temperatures, they're going to really try to make themselves as small as possible. They're gonna be as conservative with their heat um, as they can be. So they'll ball up, um, they'll have piloerection. Uh, so their hair will stand up. They have vasoconstriction. So their extremities like the tail that wraps around the mouse here and the ears will really not um, let any more heat out than necessary. And we'll also see animals that with nesting material, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a new slide, but they'll, they'll try to warm themselves by putting a cover over themselves um, to try to preserve their heat. So behavior thermoregulation, behaviorally, that is the preferred way that a mouse um, or rat would adapt to cold stress. It's really geared, as I mentioned on the last slide, to minimize the energy expenditures and maintain the core temperature. Typically, these behavioral adaptations, um, the, the heat-seeking behaviors, the thermotaxis, as it's called, um, happen within that cold environment before a full spectrum of all the physiologic responses, like the shivering and non-shivering thermogenesis. So behavioral thermoregulation will center around sustained metabolic heat through the mechanisms, as I mentioned, and nest building is a big one of them. Um, we may see postural changes that I already mentioned on the slide before, um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the nest building because this has been really interesting data that's come from a number of our collaborators. Um, the, these pictures that I'll show you are from Brianna Gaskell's work uh, with her colleagues, just looking at what entails a nest. And what I've got here are on the left um, upper picture, this is a better nest puck that's been, shred it's basically paper shreds um, that the mouse pulls apart and develops into a nest. So it's a nice bald shape. Um, it looks like a, a sphere. And if we look at how um, Brianna set up this naturalistic nest scoring, um, it's a diagram here where the more spherical and the higher the dome shape. So a five means a really good nest and a two would be a pretty flat nest, one that just doesn't even kind of come up and around um, the animal at all. We also have a lot of nestlets or cotton um, flat pads that then can be shred by mice into larger nests. And more recently, we've actually been combining these two at our institution. We're seeing animals will make an even more impressive nest if they have two different substrates to do that with. I just wanted to show you a pretty cool picture too from one of my other colleagues, John, uh, Dr. John David. He's a lab animal vet who worked on cold stress and analyzed different caging types and impacts for his PhD. So he's got this neat picture here which shows um, we have a lot of plastic huts that may be used. And when he actually did some thermography on this, I hope everyone can appreciate in the color schematic that it's most warm for an animal reaching that thermoneutral zone of 30 degrees um, centigrade within the hut and then farther out it has the more cool temperatures of the ambient area of the cage itself. So animals can conserve heat by hiding out in these little igloos that we put in for them. So I wanted to show you just where the rodent fat stores exist because as I mentioned, behavioral responses will occur first and if that does not suffice to warm an animal toward its thermoneutral thermo zone, then it will actually have some physiologic responses as well. And this image is taken from an April 2016 paper that just shows the distribution of fat. Um, this is a, a mouse um, here. So we have two subcutaneous pads and lots of visceral pads. Um, the visceral depots are listed here on the right and the subcutaneous depots are on the left. 
um, really what I'd like to direct your attention to is um, the awareness that there is a brown adipose tissue is what BAT stands for, and also white adipose tissue. We'll talk a bit about brown adipose tissue, which is shared by both mice and rats. Um, it's really heavily deposited here in the interscapular region. Um, this tends to be a place where we do a lot of scruffing. It tends to be a place where we put uh, subcutaneous transponder chips. In fact, this tissue can become so active at times um, that it actually can obscure imaging that's done for other modeling practices um, in the mice themselves. So as I said, just to recap again, um, the mice are very sensitive to ambient temperatures. Um, the, if they get below 28 degrees centigrade, they're probably going to start looking for ways to warm themselves. And then they'll eventually move to their own heat production, which happens in that brown adipose tissue. Rats have a bit of a change because they're so much bigger. Um, they have a more stable core temperature and a lower basal metabolic rate that changes to a smaller degree based on environmental exposures. Um, they also, rats tend to have a greater insulation and reduced thermal conductance. So even though it remains stable, more stable for rats at the core temperature, they sometimes are less able to quickly thermoregulate compared to mice. So overall, this non-shivering thermogenesis that I've mentioned is different than shivering thermogenesis. So if people can think when you're really cold or if you've been in that environment where you just can't get warm, your teeth chatter, you may actually have some sort of muscle spasms, that's called shivering thermogenesis. And it's very rare for rodents to go through that because they typically can warm themselves sufficiently by employing the energy from the brown adipose tissue. It's um, sort of a bit of a misnomer to call this adipose tissue because it's not typical fat. It's really more activated like skeletal muscle cells. It's very rich in mitochondria, has a high capacity for oxidative metabolism. It's really excellent at generating heat. And under cold conditions, catecholamines will stimulate these brown fat cells to produce that non-shivering thermogenesis. What's really interesting is that blood flow, blood flow to that brown adipose tissue will increase when animals are cold and it serves as a little heater for the blood supply that then is warmed and returns to the general circulation and is redistributed to organs that again help to maintain and um, build the core temperature. Warmed blood does not return quite as much because of the physiology of the rodents to the peripheral sites. So the warmed blood doesn't go to the tails and ears because as I mentioned before, they've already employed their peripheral vasoconstriction to limit heat loss from extremities. It's a pretty neat system for how they'll warm themselves. Now this doesn't happen throughout the entire day and night cycle. I want to show you some interesting data that shows the difference here. So this is a time course of the core temperatures that were monitored by radio telemetry in Long Evans rats. And again, this was um, work modified from my colleague, Chris Gordon. So we've got core temperature on the top graph here on the Y axis, and the light cycle is over the X axis in all three of the graphs. So we'll start with the top one. Uh, the dark cycle goes from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. And the activity of the animals is very high at that time. So um, as we look at the bottom activity, animals are, are quite moving around quite a bit during that time, particularly right when the lights go off and right before the lights come back on. So if we then swap back up to the top graph, their own core temperature elevates naturally because they're moving around a lot more. And then if we look at the middle graph, what Chris wanted to show was that when they're active and they're warmed on their own merit just from moving around, the temperature that they would select to be at is actually drops. So we can't necessarily say every animal wants to be at 30 degrees Celsius because they're cold stressed in the ambient environments. Rodents will actually, throughout the dark cycle, because they're more active, choose cooler temperatures at which they would prefer to hang out to offset the heat generated from their own activity. So this will be important when we talk about ways to think about uh, overcoming thermo, um, non-thermoneutral conditions. There's one more paper that I thought would be interesting to show in the webinar that came out more recently that just talks about the predicted effects of these higher temperatures on maternal behavior and their offspring. So known and predicted effects are shown in this figure here. Known are on the left and predictions are on the right. So let me talk you through this a little bit. As I mentioned, this just came out last year and I thought it had some really fascinating findings. 
So what has been shown by these groups is that pups that are born into elevated temperatures are known to have decreased maternal nest bouts. So that means they're spending less time in the nest um, because they're warmer and they're developing. There's earlier weaning, they like to play a lot, they explore more, they're much more independent. Um, they actually, as I said, can, can grow up faster and be weaned sooner. So my question would be, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I think it kind of depends on the perspective and what the research objectives may be. This paper predicted a chain of events from this elevated temperature environment. So if we presume that the elevated temperatures will decrease the amount of time spent in the nest by pups, this would logically lead to decreases in the contact dependent maternal care, such as the licking and grooming of the pups, which is quite important. Maternal care is known to have direct and cascading effects on offspring's cognition and behavior. And it has been shown that mouse pups with less interactive mothers may be more aggressive during play. Um, they may not be able to rely on social learning. There's been the link to having potentially increased anxiety responses and um, decreased synaptogenesis in the hippocampus. Overall, this could be a concern for learning and memory. And these papers would suggest that the changes in cognition, behavior, and physiology of offspring may occur in families, the mothers and the pups that are exposed to warmer temperatures. So you may have a generational um, effect from this. So this work I felt was important to highlight because when we consider, and I know certainly investigators at my own institution have said, oh, let's just turn up the thermostat in every room to get the models that we want to see come to light. Well, this might offset some of the positives that are highlighted in those papers, that ramping up those temperatures may not be the perfect way to address issues, especially in established breeding colonies where behavior is really important for that particular research lab. So moving into common practices that could unknowingly contribute to temperature considerations, this is really kind of the facilities piece of the talk today. So there are a lot of factors that could lead to disruptions in offering a stable, consistent thermoneutral temperature. Uh, beyond the reminder that the guide would like us all to keep our rooms at 20 to 26 degrees Celsius, um, as I mentioned, that's pretty much the human's thermoneutral point around that 72 to 73 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 degrees Celsius. But we have to think about the facilities we have. I, I know that I don't have a magic wand here to be able to say every single room stays at 72 degrees every single day. So for us, we have a range of facility ages. Um, we are at one of the premier land grant institutions. So we've had facilities that basically range from being decades old to a um, few weeks old, you know, just about to move animals into those spaces. We have facilities that were retrofitted to hold animal spaces. And so as a result of that, I have a lot of variability, as I'm sure some of you do as well, in the size of the rooms, how the housing rooms are arranged, where the procedure rooms may be located and those the size for those as well, and even surgical spaces. And I'll show you some um, pictures of why that's something to consider. In addition, there can be a variety of caging styles. So I've shown you that we've recently been moving over the last few years to Animal Care Systems Optimize. Um, we use a different style for our rats. We have a lot of static boxes still. We have some older caging um, disposable style cages as well. And all of these may have different temperature effects on the animals that are housed within them. And then of course, we just have a lot of uncontrolled influences. Um, in particular for us, we have seasonal weather fluctuations in the state of Michigan. And although we have closed facilities that are underground, somehow those weather fluctuations can still make an impact. Um, certainly equipment failures can happen across the age of facilities that we have. Unexpected items come up. Um, we can have power outages. Um, this is a, not an actual photo from something that happened, but we did have uh, one of our buildings, a truck went right into an outside power line and half the building lost um, power for a good several hours before that was restored. So again, all of these things just are examples of challenges. I'm sure there are many more that you two could think of for why it's so hard to keep that temperature constant across all of our rodent housing areas. 
And then if we move into the rooms, um, basically this is what we might see. So here are some static boxes. Um, this may actually serve better to conserve some heat in place of the individually ventilated. It really just depends. Um, as I mentioned, this is the style that we've moved away from in some areas this to the IVC that are hooked up to our building system. Um, just I also wanted to point out this is a, a hamster here who's modeling for us but the amount of metal the amount of, of sheer cold metal that we have um, out of necessity because it's what we have to clean and sterilize for animals um, is pretty pretty abundant in the lab animal practice. Um, even here, this, this is taken inside of a hood that has a metal base. Um, we may be putting animals on top of wire bars. Um, this is an example here for getting blood collection. And then surgery for us um, really can happen at any area that has airflow. It could be on a lab bench. But a lot. what I wanted to point out here is that this is going to be within a hood. So the sash is down over the surgeon's arms. As he's manipulating the animal, we've got a metal bottom to this, metal sides. There's a lot of airflow happening in this space as well. And again, it's just something to consider that all of these room air exposures may happen. Um, it's going to impact the temperature of the animals that we work with and how to offset all of those variables is what I'm very interested in us continuing to study uh, collaboratively and cooperatively in lab animal medicine. So for rodent surgery, I just wanted to highlight this because it's been an area of interest, as I said, and there's so many things to consider here. So we'll just kind of walk through everything. So we have a scavenging system. This is our one of our typical setups, again, on a metal table that we can disinfect. Um, I want to thank uh, one of my colleagues here at MSU, Dr. Jacqueline Devalier, for the help with this. So the scavenging system. Um, basically we'll pull gas away from the animal. We have a vaporizer to deliver isofluorine, an induction box, so animals will move from this space over to um, the surgical area. We've done a lot of work looking at, at the temperatures surrounding asep aseptic scrub approaches, um, both in work done by Anya and by Jacqueline. Um, we have the infrared scanner, which will help us to determine the temperature surrounding the animal during surgery. We have a warm water circulating pad. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that because I think those are one of our favorite ways to heat animals. Um, we do have a rectal probe, so we've got to set that up and the rectal probe goes into the mouse at the very middle of this picture. So we've got a lot of stuff going on, plus a bigger room, the airflow of the room and an animal that's been anesthetized with cold gases um, on, on basically only one surface being warmed. How can we work to keep this animal warm and not have it be impacted as well? So these are just some of the things to consider um, for our facility areas and how we just handle the rodents that we work with. So how to offset some of these cold stress environments. One of the things that we recently had um, implemented at Michigan State University due to recruitment of an investigator was that they wanted to have a room that was designed especially for their work on cardiovascular models, and disease and stroke models. So this is a whole room that has been, um, was designed specially to be able to heat, uh, keep the heat at about 84 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 degrees Celsius. Um, they use heaters on the cages individually when they move them to any other lab area. And the animals are really quite normal otherwise, although they do tend to sleep a bit more when they're at warmer temperatures. Um, that's an interesting thing to consider that mice and rats and cold temperatures will actually be awake quite a bit more than they will be um, when they're warmed up. The humidity in this room is adjusted so that it's going to stay within the range of 30 to 70 percent even though the temperatures are higher. And that's something that I will say um, for those who may be listening on the webinar today, um, we did look at one of our uh, multi-room facilities about cranking up the heat across the entire facility. Um, we were looking at doing that in the summer when it was very warm and humid outside and trying to keep um, a balance inside. It's very difficult if you haven't previously designed a facility to be able to manage the energy and the humidity to achieve that just by turning up the thermostat. Um, it really resulted in a lot of fluctuations. It was a good experiment for us to try and see if it was even feasible for us to do that. So this room I just wanted to emphasize was specially designed to be able to be a hot room. 
So in the absence of that, because many institutions don't have the ability to just design a room from scratch and make sure that it can be warm, there are other options. So we have thermal care units that we've used before and animals can just go into these spaces. You can actually fit a whole rodent cage inside of these. Uh, there also are smaller racks that the whole rack itself, this is one that um, Alt Design has used before and just a, sub, a section of cages, not a full rack, can go onto this and it can be manually adjusted for heating up just those cages. So that the concern, um, the idea behind this um, that might be problematic, it gets back to that preference graph that I showed you. So animals may not always wanna be in the same temperature at the same time, um, even if we do warm everything up. So I just wanna show you again, a little bit of data around this. Um, back again to uh, Chris Gordon, who's done so much work on this over the last 20 some years. But if we do provide only a solitary temperature to a housing room or cage, um, it's been shown that rodents, if given a choice, will seek out the thermoneutral temperatures during the light phase and then seek a different temperature during the dark cycle when they're more active. So I've shown you that graphically already. So for that reason, we need to consider in our modern facilities how we can provide that preference testing. And this really isn't even behavioral preference testing. This is just what we could provide to our normal colonies. So we also need to consider that if we raise the ambient temperature of a vivarium, that all the folks that are wearing layers of personal protective equipment are gonna be subjected to heat stress. So to try to offset that, Chris looked at um, sort of a raised floor option. So he's got cages here with um, enrichment and um, nesting material, and he had the, a false floor put in them so that it was two centimeters above the cage floor. And within those, he was able to put basically a hand warmer device. Um, these are similar akin to what one might use if you live in Denver and are going skiing and you want to keep your hands warm um, when you're out on the slopes. So he did some testing of how long after the chemical activation, those uh, hand warmers that they actually would stay warm, he monitored that they got up above 30 degrees uh, Celsius, which is pretty impressive, and then how long um, it took for the um, temperatures to basically go away. So he was able to say that he was um, happy with getting about um, 12 hours worth of heat um, to get the animal into a thermoneutral environment, um, this cage in particular, just by putting the hand warmers underneath this false floor. Um, the mice then can select the warmer temperature that would be over the hand warmer and then go to a cooler ambient spot during the dark phase if needed. Um, and I did have some communication um, from recent studies that were done with colleagues at UC Denver that have shown a similar time course using the chemical gel or space gel heating devices that also can warm cages on racks for a period of time. I just wanna emphasize it's really important not to put these hand warmers or the space gels in direct contact with rodents because they tend to have very hot, spot, very hot spots on them um, and may result in thermal burns um, that you would not want to have your animals um, suffer from. So there always needs to be some sort of a barrier between these um, chemical heat selections and the uh, animals themselves. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about and mention at the beginning of the webinar is the application of heat sources to individual cages. And this was where we worked with animal care systems. Um, they provided us with a prototype cage setup, the smart rack system. Um, we did this work last summer. Um, they have racks that will hold mouse cages and then we also have one that will hold rat cages. So the picture on the left shows the mouse rack. It has 10 cages in each row. There's one row that's heated and one row that's unheated. And then in the uh, right here, we have the rat opta rat cage. Um, it's got six cages that are heated and six cages or six slots for cages that would be unheated. Um, there is a control panel at the top uh, for each individual slot where a cage can be placed. And it allows you to heat a portion of the cage floor to various temperatures by manually adjusting that plate temperature. So we were really excited to partner with this brand new um, cage and rack setup to explore the potential of the rack being the solution to the effect of cold stress in rodents. Um, I'll show you some of the data that we came out from this, with from this pilot study. So 
So if we just look at what an OptiMouse cage looks like, this is our typical cage that we use in any of our rooms now. Um, it's set up as an aerial view um, on the left um, here, and then I'll show you what the smart rack um, looks like on the right. So we start with the left. This is our cage. We've got basic corn cob bedding on a layer along the bottom. We have our enrichment disc of better nests on the left here. Um, there is an elevated food hopper and an elevated water bottle. So if we clear out all of the bedding and enrichment for you and place it on the smart rack, what we wanted to show you was that there's this red rectangle. Um, once you remove the materials that you can see, this is the smart rack and this is the heat source um, for the individual cage that's placed over that. So we wanted to assess what the heat was going to be uh, through manual um, evaluation of what did you need to change the heat on the panel to get the right heat into the cage. So keeping in mind there was one cage temperature at the actual rack level and then when you put the plastic cage on we wanted to see what was what, what was the mouse actually going to feel within the cage through the plastic. So we designed the study so that we looked at the cage separately. Quadrant one was the area and the orange spot is where we took the um, temperature reading of the plastic right over the middle of the red triangle, the heat pad. Quadrant two was located underneath the food hopper. Quadrant three now actually is a little bit off of the rack. So hopefully you can look through and see that the edge of the smart rack comes here. And so these cages are designed to hang a little bit over that lip. So quadrant three fell underneath the water bottle and quadrant four um, was here on the left. So just clockwise, that's how we looked at things. We also, um, this is the cage front for CF here, if you're wondering, that was just for orientation. So what we ended up doing quite a bit of that summer um, was averaging the temperatures that were compiled into a voltage temperature guide so we could determine exactly what voltage we needed to apply um, in order to get heat into the cage at a specific temperature. Now the current generation of the smart rack, the one that was most recently debuted uh, National ALAS, has adjusted this so there's manual control for each cage to within a plus or minus degree Celsius. So that is going to be really nice for people using these. And then the way that we set this up was with a GoPro camera over two different cages, one that was heated and one that was not heated. So for our pilot studies, we were looking at the effects of supplemental heat on breeding behavior, nest building, and anesthetic recovery. We use a transgenic mouse model that was on a B6 background that we just were using as breeding population from an in-house colony. Mice were all implanted with sub-Q temperature transponders from the biomedic data systems. Uh, that provides each mouse with an ID number and helps to decrease the handling and stress during sequential temperature collections. So um, I've been doing work with those transponders for many years and found that they work really well. Um, importantly, they do have a correlation with rectal temperatures, which a lot of people use. So we set up six breeding pairs that were placed on the rack. Three of those were given maximum plate heat and three were not given heat. Um, and again, this was just kind of showing how we set these up. We have the GoPro camera in the green circle here that can look down on two cages at once. And then this is the aerial view in the dark cycle um, of what the recordings looked like. And we have two cages of interest that were captured in each picture. We did record these cages for a 24 hour period at the initial and two week post placement on the rack, as well as looking just around the time of pup delivery. So the picture here shows that GoPro dark cycle image. Orange triangle is the heated cage and the blue represents the non-heated cage. Um, we looked at a picture like this every 15 minutes to check the mouse and nest location. Um, we looked at them on the first day of the rack placement and then at three times a week. And we did score these nests based on that naturalistic nest scoring system developed in a previous study. Um, and what I showed you from the schematic, um, the, five, the scale of one out of five that um, Brianna Gaskell and colleagues had developed. And then on this, I just wanted to show the data. So the top graph shows the mouse location during the initial and two week post rack placement during the dark cycle. Um, the recording sessions that we looked at um, show here the percent observations and the time spent in the quadrant, and then each of the quadrants is along the X axis. The blue bars are the non-heated cages and the orange bars are heated. And what we found, because the dark cycle um, is when nocturnal animals are most active, they're going to eat the most then, they're going to move around the most then, we did not really have a preference 
for the, where the mice were spending their time across the quadrants, regardless of whether there was heat offered or not. I mean, maybe a little bit, but again, these were, as I hope, hopefully people did hear me say, this was pilot work, small numbers of animals, um, not, not statistically analyzed at this point, but definitely of interest to build studies from. Um, we also looked at where the nest location was going to be placed in heated versus non-heated cages. Um, and this was a little more telling and what we were able to see ourselves is that mice in the heated cages tended to build their nests directly over the heat in quadrant one, whereas in the non-heated cages, it didn't really seem like there was much of a location preference if you look at the blue bars ac across quadrants. So as we expected, um, mice who received supplemental heat tended to have a decreased nest score as represented in this table. Um, we expected this. So this is, again, the score out of five. Um, so the heated um, animals were not as robust in their dome-like structures that they built. Um, small difference, but appreciable. And what I showed in these pictures is that a heated cage has sort of a flattened nest really weren't very robust because they probably didn't need them as much as in the non-heated cages um, where they're, as we mentioned previously, the behavioral thermoregulation is going to be to build a structure that's gonna help to um, keep the heat conserved. So in conclusion, our pilot study showed a number of things that, um, but in particular that in these heated cages, when there is a heat option, they tend to build their nests and spend more time over the heat plate. Um, so we showed this, this before, the, the nest tended to be by the heat plate, um, and in the heated cages, the nests were not as robust. Um, they were more thermally comfortable. So this information has been really helpful to us as we move forward and explore the smart system's potential um, for future studies, and, and we have yet to explore what's happening with the laboratory rat, so that is on the docket to study next. Um, as I said, the um, data was taken from a small cohort. So what I want to tell you about the breeding data, again, not statistically analyzed, but what happened when we looked at mothers and pups and what happened when we looked at anesthetic recovery times. So on the assessment of moms with their pups, which is here's a mom here with her litter, we found that pups in heated cages were born on average about a day sooner than non-heated cage pups. Um, the number of pups between groups didn't really vary although we did see a trend that pups in the unheated cages tended to weigh a little bit more um, than those uh, that were in, within heated cages at the time of birth. So we do plan to repeat this work in collaboration with um, ACS in an expanded experiment. So there'll be more to come on breeding input. And as many of us are aware, uh, when researchers need to perform anesthetic procedures on their animals, a great deal of time goes into watching those animals recover after the procedure, particularly when injectable anesthetic agents have been used. So a goal that I had was to figure out a way that we could potentially use the smart rack system for knowing that animals would recover. It would allow a researcher to put their cage back on the rack and not have to sit in, um, like we require a watching of animals every 10 to 15 minutes until they're um, basically conscious and moving around. So we did an experiment to look at whether the animals were over the plate in the cage, or we also compare that to warm water with circulating blankets um, and try to set it up so the same quadrant was affected. We found that the water blanket mice recovered faster than all the groups on the smart system rack mice. Um, potentially this was due to the static nature of the cages when they're off the rack, because these were placed, these cages off the rack were placed within a change station that was in the room. Um, the other thing to note, of course, is that the warm water blanket fills the entire quadrant um, and the heat pad for the smart rack doesn't quite fill the quadrant, so there may be a, a change in heat that's available there. But um, we will continue to search for a heating option to aid in anesthetic recovery. We want to make sure that that maintains animal welfare and decreases the amount of time um, that researchers may need to spend observing the animals directly. So along those lines then, we've looked at a couple of other heat sources in the last year as well, some of which was presented at the National ALAS meeting. Um, this is work done with Seth and Pitsley. We wanted to try to find an option where we could heat cages potentially after a flood or again after anesthesia. So we came up with um, a pretty inexpensive option, a terrarium mat that can sit um, it's about $15. It just sits underneath the cage. There's a gradient so that there's an aspect of the cage where the mouse can move to if it's too warm 
um, under the terrarium mat. And we did study over time how hot the um, mat becomes and what the temperature is within the cage. We augment it with a heat lamp um, here that's uh, left on for at least 10 minutes. And then the vet staff can come back and check on these animals. Uh, researchers can come back and check on the animals as well as they get warmed up. And then we most recently looked at um, some rat studies looking at recovery times and pre-warming before surgery on warm water blankets or in using an easy heat system from Easy Systems. Um, this is just a heat plate basically, and then you overlayer it with um, your surgical space and a drape for animals to rest upon. Um, we found these both to be very reliable for maintaining um, temperature throughout procedures. Um, even with the anesthesia, it was easy to manually program these. And this also aligns very much with what colleagues at UC Denver have shown, um, uh, talking about success stories in warm water blankets used under static cages. It really can help with small cohorts you may have for researchers that want to do um, a few animals at thermo neutrality. These warm water blankets can maintain temperatures in the mid 80s as long as they're plugged in and moving along. Um, they really do hold pretty well um, for small groups. Um, and allow for some of the pilot work to potentially be done for thermo neutral studies at your institutions. So just as we finish up here, I just wanted to touch on what the vivarium of the future might look like at this point. So will it be that um, this is the next major transformation of how we think about lab animal practice? And when we go to temperatures that basically have our staff and us um, kind of sweating a lot um, and needing to cool off? Or you know, are we gonna stay put and think about how we warm, warm our rodent patients um, a bit more? So just as we approach the, the final points here, I wanted to share just a few examples of what's happening in biomedical research now and how models are really being impacted to help you think about and have discussions related to housing temperatures. So the first one we'll talk about is the microbiome because it's a, also a pretty hot topic right now. So given what I've shared that thermoneutral housing impacts the immune response, food intake and weight gain, it's been hypothesized that environmental temperatures would also alter intestinal microbiomes. And the definition for microbiome, I would just use as generally the collection of microorganisms, which include bacteria, viruses, fungi, et cetera, that live in the gut. So the microbiome is quite important because the gut flora has been shown to play a critical role in numerous health processes. And um, we have seen data from colleagues, um, Craig Franklin and others around the country, that if rodents arrive with a certain microbiome from the vendor environment, this shifts based on water, food, animal exposures at the receiving institution. And then you layer onto that that housing temperatures can impact things by disrupting flora. So what's been shown um, within this review paper is that animals that are in cold stress or long-term cold housing actually have a change in their gut. The um, areas of the small intestine become more absorptive, not only through a lengthening of the intestine, but also an increased height to villi and microvilli, which is adjusting physiologically to absorb more to increase the energy, to meet the increased energy demands that the animals have. Really fascinating stuff. So we think about cancer work. Uh, this was a group that realized that ambient temperatures had not really been looked at very closely in, um, in neoplasia studies. So they were aware that cool housing temperatures were not always a benign variable, and they thought there could be an impact on experimental endpoints. So they looked at several different tumor models, things that have been widely studied, and compared tumor formation, growth, and metastasis at either the ambient or thermoneutral housing temperatures. And they found really fascinating and significant differences. Basically, back to that intact immune response being incredibly important um, for animals, when it's altered, as it might be in a cold stressed animal, it can play a major role in um, how tumor burden exemplifies itself. So cold stressed animals, have been shown to have a dampened immune response and therefore tumors can actually grow more quickly in some of those models. The next one I wanted to just touch on is atherosclerosis and inflammation. So we said, we know that housing temperatures affect heart rate, we said that heart rates are much higher in cold temperatures. So weight can also be impacted and inflammation is, is impacted as well. All of those heart rate, weight and inflammation play important roles in atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease. And when wild-type mice, which we 
typically have used as one of the most common experimental models for looking at the mechanisms underlying immunopathogenesis of human disease. Um, they don't work. The wild type mice are presumed not to work for the modeling of atherosclerosis. So this lab turned up the temperature and found that um, they were able to turn the, basically unmask the phenotype is the best way to put it, for wild type mice by feeding them a in a thermoneutral environment, feeding them a Western diet. They got the animals to become obese, which they had not been able to do before, and actually develop uh, mild atherosclerosis, which they had not been able to do before. So therefore, again, thermoneutral housing may allow for improved modeling of multiple cardiac disorders. And then the last thing I just want to touch on because it hit home for us at MSU was um, for liver disease models. This is work um, by our colleague Sinad at Cincinnati Children's. He also showed an unmasking of desired phenotypes at thermoneutral temperatures. And he was brought in to give a seminar at MSU um, in our pharmacology and toxicology department. I had a lot of people that are studying liver disease and liver toxicity. And I had a lot of requests after his talk could we please come up with an area for folks to do their liver studies? Because they felt like they really could see the disease model um, much better at thermoneutrality. So we're going to continue to work on that here at my institution. So it's become second nature. And you know, when, when we talk about reproducibility, that mice don't work. And what I wanted to show you just in this slide is that there are a lot of factors that go on with why we are not always able to repeat things. Um, and I just wanted to remind everybody that part of that um, is because of the thermoneutral housing initiative that we're talking about. There's been considerable data amassed now, as I mentioned, for well over 20 years. Um, my, as I said, Chris Gordon has been publishing on this for a very long period of time that would suggest that the cold stress of housing mice below their natural comfort zone just affects the physiology in so many ways that it makes it virtually impossible for us to model human homeostasis. So it's something just to consider. Um, I wish I could end the webinar with a schematic of the vivarium of the future that incorporates all of the temperature, um, environmental changes that would permit our animals to not only select their preferred temperatures, but then also allow disease phenotypes to flourish. But really at this point, there's, there's really not a single solution and there's not a simple solution to the conundrum. There's a lot of analysis yet to be done. So I look forward to being part of the continued discussions and hope this information will help you all to further discuss and ultimately address the topic of rodent thermoregulation. So with that, I just would really like to acknowledge the incredible group of professionals that I get to work with at Michigan State. Um, I could not have presented this work without Dr. Jacqueline Devalier's help. Um, we also have had a number of fantastic veterinary summer students that are listed here and a former student who is now graduated and in a lab animal program, Anya, as well. And plus all of our colleagues in the training areas, operations, et cetera, and our animal care staff. Um, animal Care Systems took a chance to do a pilot study with us, and we really enjoyed that, and I think it's been mutually beneficial, so I wanted to thank all of them. And also the funding um, that's gone into this, because as we know, research is expensive and worthy, and uh, we want to make sure we thank everyone who supports us. And the last pitch beyond thanking uh, Austin and Teresa for their help with the webinar today is just to mention that um, much of the work that I showed um, for the graphs and other publications came from John and Chris. Um, both of them were co-authors with me on this review paper that came out last year. And a special shout out to Jim Marks, who worked with me um, before I was at MSU at the University of Pennsylvania. We did a lot of collaborative studies there as well. So I'd encourage you to take a look at this um, comparative medicine review article. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hankinson. And I apologize uh, for the technical difficulties, everybody. We do have some questions, Dr. Hankinson, for you. What do you recommend as optimal temperature for post-op recovery? I'll just get to the end here too. Okay. Um, so the question is, what do we recommend for the optimal recovery temperature for post-operative? Is that correct? Correct, Dr. Hankinson. So we've been looking at this a lot. I really appreciate that question. I feel strongly that at least having the warm water recirculating blanket set at about 38 uh, to 42 degrees, so maybe in the middle of that even um, uh, 40 degrees Celsius is really helpful. Um, having the animals in a cage that's got a lid on it so it's not open air 
also will help with that. Um, we haven't seen issues develop where there's humidity or moisture that develops inside the cage during that time, um, but I think that is really beneficial to keep it at, at a minimum of 37 degrees Celsius up to about 40 on the, on the blanket itself. Thank you, Dr. Hankinson. The next question is, does a mouse's body fat go into effect after a flooded cage? And if so, can a mouse recover from a flood with just their body fat or does helping them with a heat lamp increase their recovery more? That's a really great question. That's another one that we have looked at quite a bit. Um, so mouse cages, and this was part of the study that we did with, um, that Stefan Pitsley and I did for ALAS this year, was because we were having issues with flooded cages um, off and on because we have static cages and water bottles. Um, we're not on an auto water system here. So if you were to dump a standard a water bottle at ambient temperature into a mouse cage, we found that by just measuring it, and this was a cage that of course we had no actual animals in, um, that water gets to be like 62 degrees Celsius or 62 degrees Fahrenheit. So much farther, colder, much lower out of the thermoneutral zone than um, then the mice should be exposed to at any point. So that was pretty alarming to see just how cold the water makes the cage environment. So I actually think that added with the fact that they're wet and they can't get away from it really does probably activate um, not only the, the non-shivering thermogenesis, you might actually get into shivering thermogenesis. And so I strongly feel that getting them out of the cage, we call it an emergency at our institution. So getting those animals out of the cage, um, dried off as quickly as possible, put into a clean, warm cage and that heat lamp, giving them the heat from the top as well as the, the mat underneath the cage is extremely helpful. Um, we do set a limit of about 10 minutes or so for that heat lamp until a vet staff member can check just to make sure we're not going to overheat the animals, um, but that this has worked pretty nicely. And then we can make a judgment if we wanna leave that heat source on for longer. Um, heat is really, really important for animals after a flooded cage. Great question. Thank you, Dr. Hankinson. The next question is, the ARRIVE guidelines have placed husbandry as not an essential component for reproducibility. How do you relate to this? Oh, the ARRIVE guidelines. Um, so they have been around. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be savvy enough to be able to tell everyone what ARRIVE stands for. It's actually an acronym um, to help with reproducibility and what uh, the mechanisms we should report on in journals would be so that someone could exactly repeat the same experiment that you have, have described. Um, but it is interesting that husbandry is not identified as something that should be discussed because I have to say, I think there's so much variability that happens um, just by one individual, even in the research lab, who might do something slightly differently with the type of enrichment if they throw a hut in, um, the, the bedding changes, if they decide a cage is too dirty, sometimes we have PIs that change out their cages sooner than we would. I mean, those things actually really can add up. Um, so I, I have to politely say that I think there's a, there's a lot being missed if we don't consider the husbandry component of how we take care of our mice and rats. Thanks, Dr. Hankinson. The last question is, what is the recommendation when the Wistar rat is receiving a wild lactococcus and another group like the recombinant strain and make sure that the temperature does not affect it? Is this the best system? I'm not sure I understand the question, Austin. Could you repeat it again? Sure. What is the re recommendation when a Wistar rat is receiving a wild lactococcus and another group, the recumbent strain, and make sure that this temperature is not affected? Is this the best system? Um, I'm not sure I understand if the person is asking about infecting animals with different strains of bacteria. And so is it an infectious disease model that they're asking about? Um, and in the interest of time, I would welcome that person to reach out and just email me that question. If they can give me a little more detail, I'd be happy to do my best to answer it. For sure, yeah, we can put uh, you and the questioner in contact for some information. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just maybe losing a little bit in the translation of it over the, the web system. No worries, Dr. Hankinson. Uh, we thank you once again, Dr. Hankinson, for the webinar. And thank thanks so everyone. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. We understand there were some audio issues during the presentation. We will have a recording freely available in the coming days on the Animal Care Systems website. Also stay tuned after the new year for the announcement of our next webinar. Until then,